Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study, our book of Luke, the light giver, chapter 23. We're going to pick it up here in a moment with verse 47. Christ has just um, passed his spirit back to the Father from whence he came, being the Father. And, but which were the last words in the Psalm of Psalms 22? We have the total and complete lesson taught by him, even as he was on the cross paying the price for us, he still teaches and taught, whereby we have that hope of eternal life. If we love him, if we follow him, he paid the way, he paid the price for you, and you especially if you're one of God's elect, to stand against the false one at his appearance all an example of how it would be, even down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross, written a thousand years before the fact, the very words coming out of the chief priest's mouth stated a thousand years before the fact. Now, man could not prearrange for the chief priest, the Roman soldiers, which were of two different elks, to come out with the same actions and words. Man couldn't do that. But our Father can. And it was written, and that's exactly how it came to pass. That should strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Having said that, let's pick it up as um, he passes on the cross. Chapter 23, verse 47, the great book of Luke, verse 47 reads, Now when the centurion saw what was done, I mean that darkness from 12 noon till 3 p.m., he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. I mean, with all these miracles taking place, 48, and all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breast and returned. In other words, um, here we see the people connecting to this Savior, Believing even at this time, 49, and all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. Now, the women never deserted him. They were on that little knoll over there. Now, John was the only disciple that did not desert him, but Christ sent him away anyway with his mother Mary to protect her and take care of her. But... Um, other than that, the only people that remained was the, were the women, Mary Magdalena probably being one of the better known, verse 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. Now, the reason he's a good man, he's a Christian. He was a believer of Christ. Why? Because he was related to him. Listen carefully, 51. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He didn't consent to the crucifixion. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, or the Judeans of Judah, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. Why? He was a Christian. Now, we know not from Bible, but from history, that he was the uncle of Mary, Christ's mother meaning also he was Christ's uncle. This gives him the biblical right for kinsman redeemer, which means he's, he is the closest of kin that has a right to claim the body of Christ. And we, this is the reason we show the little documentary Traditions of Glastonbury. For in Glastonbury, England, you will see these old ancient um, uh, pieces of a man in a ship with a little boy up in the bow, and that boy being Christ when he was growing up, and his uncle Joseph 
in the back because Joseph had ten mines in, in this area, many of them. He was a very wealthy person. And they still sing this song about Joseph the Tin Man in, in Glastonbury, England. This is not just a fairy tale, it's history. And that is the reason being the next of kin and being an official, God arranges everything. That he was there and that he would make this uh, kinsman redeemer claim. Verse 52, this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus as kinsman redeemer, of course. 53, and he took him down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in a supplica that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. It was, it was Joseph's own tomb, this wealthy man. I mean, hewn a... a, a one hewn the sepulchre, hewn in stone, which is no easy task or inexpensive task, and fresh and new for a rich man. Because even though Christ paid that price, and even though he was hung with malefactors, he was buried with the wealthy. Do you understand that that is prophecy? It certainly is, and, uh, and so it was. Uh, but Joseph asking, verse 54, and that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on, and naturally this was the lamb. 55, and the women also which came with him from Galilee followed him after, and behold, beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. They were eyewitnesses to this. They observed it and took all this in and uh, being uh, well accounted for it. 56, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. In other words, it was necessary to do this. Now, I, I want to fill here, when was Christ, what day of the week was Christ crucified on? Christ was crucified, you with companion Bibles, you have an appendix with all this laid out minute by minute practically. He was crucified on a Wednesday, and it was necessary before sundown, which at that time started the new day. You could not have someone on the cross after sundown, so he was taken and placed in the tomb on Thursday, which would be after sundown on Wednesday, the way they account. And then he was in that tomb from Wednesday sundown to Thursday sundown one day. He was in that tomb from Thursday sundown to Friday sundown two days. He was in that tomb from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown three days. And sometimes after sundown in the, in the nighttime, he resurrected. He blew right from that temple and uh, came to life. So therefore, you have the reckoning on the calendar as to what day, why he was in that tomb three days. A lot of people try to make this Friday. That won't work, okay? And it's not according to history. So if you're going to teach truth, teach truth. Chapter 24, verse 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, these women did, and certain others with them. They were going to prepare this body and, and preserve it too. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. It was huge. It had been rolled away. Verse 3. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. He was gone. Why? He was ascended, resurrected. Verse 4. And it came to pass, as they which were perplexed thereabout, uh, beheld two men 
stood by them in shining garments. It was two young people. Their appearance was young. Why? They were angels. Verse 5, And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, the, the angel said to the women, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Now, I want you to absorb that real good. Because our Father is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Quite frankly, no one has died spiritually. You either are in a flesh body or you're in a spiritual body. But nobody will die spiritually until the second death, which is the last verse of, of chapter 20, the great book of Revelation. After, naturally, the judgment, the great white throne judgment. How could someone be sentenced to death without a trial? God doesn't operate that way. So that's why these angels, direct from our Father, would say to them, he, He's alive. Why are you out here looking in the tombs for Him? In the first place, remember, Christ had told them, I'm going to be crucified, but on the third day, you return to our place, and I will meet you there. He's going to be resurrected, okay? Verse uh, 6, he had warned them of this. Did they listen? Well, let's find out. Verse 6, the angel continues speaking. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. He told you this is how it would happen. You know, Always remember, you can believe the Word of God. If it's translated properly, you can, you can ride on it because that's exactly how it's going to be. Never argue with the Word of God. If you're a believer, believe. Verse 7, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and he was, and be crucified, and he was, and the third day rise again. He warned them on that third day, which that was Wednesday through uh, Saturday night, our, in, in that night of the fourth day, which would be three and a half, he resurrected. He told them he would. If they were believers, they should have believed. I feel that God caused even Peter to deny him thrice, to give us a warning because Peter had just before that lobbed the ear off of Malchus, the a servant of the high priest. He was no coward, but I feel he did it to give us a warning. Be a watchman. Don't go to sleep on watch. Keep alert. As it is written, you can count on it. Every detail that happened in his crucifixion was written in Psalms 22 a thousand years before the fact, even down to the words that would come out of the chief priest's mouth. And that chief priest was not appointed by God, but a Roman governor. How perfect it can be if you listen and if you believe the word of God. So uh, these angels told him, he told you this is what was going to happen. That's why he's not here. He lives. Verse 8. And they remembered his words. It came to them. You want to always remember his words. Verse 9, And returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. I mean, they went to that where the holding place was, and they were letting them know, He's risen! Verse 11, It was Mary Magdalena and Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. You know what? They're going to think that these women have lost it. Isn't that not strange that Christ told them on the third day, I'm going to resurrect and I will meet you back here? And they're going to doubt this. Mary Magdalena is one woman that had seven demons, seven evil spirits in her, was possessed. Christ touched and healed her, drove them away, and she was ever, ever 
so very loyal. A lot of people say she was a prostitute. She was not. It's not written. Nothing to back it up. <clears throat> but here they gave that report. That tomb is empty. Verse 7. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, um, and they believed them not. They were in a delirium. That, that, that is strange that, or silly, that even after the Lord told them <clears throat> that they would still take this attitude, that they would still um, uh, do in this way, or react in this way, and, and so it is that uh, our Father, our Father would do this, and, and so it was. Uh, and it was uh, this supplica, human, that he was placed in. 22, verse 12, rather. Then arose Peter, and he ran into the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. He wondered, how, how could that be? <clears throat> what I want to do, why was Jesus laid in a rich man's tomb? Why was he crucified between two malefactors? I, I want you to know that also was written long ago. I do it to strengthen God's word in our minds, whereby if God says it, if it's prophecy, you can count on it. Well, well where was that written? Well, it was, it was written, of course, in Isaiah chapter 53. I, I'm going to read quite a bit from this Isaiah 53. You're not going to have it, but I want you to listen. I want you to listen to Isaiah 53, which would even tell that this tender plant would come from the root of Jesse, which was David's father, through David, umbilical cord, the umbilical cord, through the mothers. Here would come from Mary's womb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells how he would live. I'm going to pick it up in verse 3 of, of uh, chapter 53. And he, dis he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him or not. They ran away. All twelve of them, with the exception of John, ran. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. When he was nailed to the cross, he was wounded, he was pierced for our transgressions, not for his, for yours. He was bruised for our iniquities, our shortcomings. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And so it is. He took those stripes. Why? Because he loves you. And this is Emmanuel, God with us. As it was written in Isaiah chapter 7, way back in chapter 7, verse 14, that this virgin would conceive and bring forth this child. And this would be Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. Don't ever, ever doubt one moment how God loves you. He paid an awesome price that you could have your sins just washed away simply for the asking and returning the love. Verse 6, And we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But do you know something? He could carry it. He could cut it. Why? Because he was perfect. He had no sin as we do. Verse 7, he was oppressed. 
and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't whimper. He didn't complain. But he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Even at the hearing, when Pilate, he wouldn't say a word, and Pilate would say in one of the Gospels, don't you realize how serious these charges are? And you do not defend yourself? And he did not open his mouth. Why? It's written right here. He was doing this for you. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? We will. God's elect shall the generation of the fig tree. For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of what? Transgressions of my people was he stricken. Not his, not his own, for he had no transgressions. And here's why we came here. Listen carefully. Nine, he made his grave with the wicked. He was crucified between two malefactors and with the rich in his death, in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, a rich tomb, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. It was for that reason. He was innocent that it could be written long ago, long, long ago, many years before the fact that Joseph would come and claim the body would have that fresh human stone, a very wealthy man's tomb, Joseph the Tin Man. And he would place him in that tomb. But just as, what did he accomplish with the malefactors? Don't you ever forget it. Even in paying the price, even then, when one of the malefactors repented, Christ forgave him and said, This day I tell you, I shall see you in paradise. And so it was that he brought salvation because of his innocence and humbly as he went through what he did for us that this malefactor was converted. And many have converted since because God's word is always true. No, this was written long ago that Joseph would give up that tomb, that there would be no reason. They sold his body for 30 pieces of silver, and it was cast uh, and purchased the potter's field, which is where old broken pots are thrown, which his blood brought. Um, that also is prophecy from this book and other books, that 30 pieces of silver, whereby when people have broken hearts and broken bodies, he can put them back together with the blood money. Now what, how much he accomplished in this suffering, this passion, his passion for you, that he loves you to this point. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, that's important, children. He shall prolong his days, and the, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Every time someone converts, even the angels rejoice. And certainly the Lord does. Why? That's why he paid the price. How, how can that be? Verse 11, listen carefully. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Don't you read over that. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's it for you. Do you know why? Because he loves you. You can believe that. He did that for us. Now, he never asked that much from us, but to witness as God's elect against the false one 
And that makes it almost a pleasure to be able to stand and witness with the Holy Spirit, His Spirit speaking through us against Satan who brought all this to pass. Whereby, as it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Christ came to this earth to be crucified to destroy death, which is to say the devil. O death, where is thy sting? Christ jerked that stinger out of death. And why, as the angels would say, why are you out here looking for the living among the dead? He did that for you. Why? Because he loves you. He defeated death for all of us. Verse 12 to complete. Therefore will I divine him a portion with the great, greatest. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, those malefactors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for all of us that we have that right on repentance, asking forgiveness for our sins and meaning it, having a change of mind that he reaches down and touches you, right? I mean, from the price paid on that cross, touches you and raises you up and gives you hope of et an eternal life simply for the asking. Why would he do that? Because he loves you. He loves you enough that he brought that to pass. And these very angels that appeared to those women and comforted them, reassured them that he was with the Father just as he had said he would be. And yet at the same time, he will reappear to them after the resurrection. He will walk with them for 40 days and nights. That's the time of probation. And he would tell them, whatever you do, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive what I'm going to send you. And naturally he was speaking of the Comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. And not some spook, not some ghost, but his own Holy Spirit to dwell with us when and in us when you believe and when you follow him. Naturally, that would happen ten days later. On that 10th day, which would be the 50th, after that Passover, it would be called Pentecost, which is what 50 is, the 50th day. How precious it is that our Father brings all this to us and for us to absorb and to know and to understand, to see the tenderness and the price he paid so that you can be cleansed. His body took the stripes. They beat him. But your body gets the healing when you believe, and when you follow him, and when you ask him. Now, returning to the, to the 24th chapter, let's pick it up with the next verse, please. Verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, it means warm baths, okay? They had a hot springs there, no doubt, and it, it was warm warm baths, emmas, em, uh, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. It's seven and a half miles down there. Went down, let's go down. I mean, here, there's all this has happened. They crucified the Lord. And they're talking about how wonderful it was walking with him and hearing him, and now he's gone. Let's just go get some warm baths. Verse 14. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. I mean, they recalled every detail. All the things that were happening at that time in that town. The crucifixion. The malefactors. 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. He actually appeared and was walking with them. Verse 15. 
to continue. I'm sorry, 16. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And I want you to see the power of God within this to teach you a lesson. God withheld the recognition of the Lord Jesus Christ for your benefit. Don't ever doubt the word of God. It's going to come to pass as it's written. You know, how many times was Christ, when he walked the earth, asked the question, uh, a, a particular question, and he would say, it's written, haven't you ever read it? And that's what he wants you to know. Have you read it? With understanding, the, the message that he brought of believing. For you see, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son, Emmanuel, God with us, that whomsoever would believe, see how important that is? Whosoever would believe upon him, what he said, what he did, prophecies that came to pass, should not perish. You're not going to die, not going to go to hell. It would have eternal, unending life. So it is. That's why it is so very important that you believe. But here, this belief was taken from them where they could not recognize him for that moment as they walked along, and, and they, were, they were so mystified and wondering. And yet Christ had told them exactly how it was going down, the crucifixion and everything connected with it. Verse 17, to continue. And he said unto them, What manner of of communications um, are these that uh, you have one to another as we walk and are sad. Well, why are you so sad? I mean, after all, you know, he had just paid the price so that any sinner on repentance could have eternal life. It's not a time for sadness. It's a time of celebration. It's a time to see the love of Almighty God. And as these two, as this was withholding from them, don't miss the lecture, the next lecture, whereby we learn what he was accomplishing here. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit Moods, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge. That's our Holy Father. And he'll do the judging, and we just do the discerning. You discern who you should study with, who you should fellowship with. That is a gift from God, this spiritual discernment is. It will always keep you out of trouble. It will, it will always aid you and help you in your walk here in the flesh body. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address, got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Just talk to him. That's what prayer is. It's simply talking to our Father from your own heart, not some written message, but being honest with him and letting him know your needs, your love, 
your understanding. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Shirley from Illinois. I've learned so much from you by watching every day. But as a learner, I have three questions. Can you explain to me the advents? Well, there's two. There's the first advent where he came, born to a, a child, innocent, to bring salvation. That's why he would pick up the book of Isaiah and say salvation is here and stop reading in the, min the middle of the sentence. And he did not say and bringing the day of vengeance because that's the second advent. In the second advent, he comes not a babe to be crucified, but he comes as king of kings and lord of lords and to rule with a rod of iron. That's the difference, first and second advent. You can read of those in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. That's 1 and 2, first advent and second advent. Uh, I, If while I'm on earth, still in this old body, if I talk to someone who is in paradise, can they hear me? Well, naturally, I think our, our Father sometimes allows things in prayer and request. When the Antichrist comes, will our bodies instantly be in spirit? No, it will not. If you had said our spirit, I could have said, well, the Holy Spirit wants to unite with you. But our bodies stay the same until the true Christ returns. You see, that's why that is ever important that you have that straight. As long as you're in a flesh body, he who claims to be Christ is lying to you. If he appears on earth in person, it's a false Christ. Because we do not change bodies until the seventh trump when the true Christ returns himself. Okay, Doris and Gary from Maryland. Um... Okay, my husband and I have looked for, uh, enjoyed your teachings. Okay, I'm looking for your question. Um, it is easier for us to understand. Well, that's what we enjoy teaching the word for. We are in our 70s, and with everything cost going up and up constantly, that what little income we get and our poor health, we cannot tithe much anymore. Will God forgive us? Well, God, God is not a slave driver, and God sees your love and your understanding, and He He wants He He knows this. When when you don't have much, you don't give much. Okay, so no, He's not going to hold that against you. Don't you even don't please don't worry about it for one second. Uh, this is why many people can't give anything but a love offering if that makes you feel good. But when you make zero a a tithe is a tenth. When you make zero, what is a tenth of zero? It's zero also. So many ministers like to, um, well, I won't go there, but don't worry about it. Uh, Louise from New York. Is it a sin to wear a wedding ring and an engagement ring? Two of my friends said their mother had to donate or give her rings over to her minister at her church because wearing them is a sin. This, this um, I've worn mine for years. I Even after my husband's death, I haven't been able to find anything in my Bible about it. The church wasn't, uh, and she mentions two particular, you know, I, I've heard just about every racket and con preacher on earth. I really have, of how they rip off senior citizens and how they rip off people. But this one takes the cake. Okay. When some preacher actually takes the wedding bands off of a woman's hand for himself and tells her it's a sin because that ring encircles that that is encompassed between Father and Abraham that two would become one in an unending, unending circle. That preacher not only showed his ignorance, his selfishness, his coveting, for he committed one of the greatest sins of all. He coveted your, your, the woman's very ring. So I've heard of a lot of preachers with con jobs and ripping people off, but that one takes the cake. 
It really does. You wear your wedding rings and be happy. Don't ever, when, don't ever let some man con you out of anything. And you did the right thing. I'm real proud of you. You couldn't find it in the Bible, so you still keep yours on. You wear it in good health. Oh, Cindy from Arizona, you often say something we find confusing, as there are draw as there are no drawings or pictures of Christ. Please explain why you say, when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Well, I'm quoting Scripture. Isn't that good enough? Frankly, there is a description. If you know how to read it, it's written in that same chapter I was reading from today in verse 1, which I didn't cover, uh, simply in saying that out of Jesse would come that sprout. He lacked nothing as far as beauty was concerned. Neither did Satan, okay? But uh, John 14, 9, John 14, 9, St. John, that is, you hear, hear Christ himself saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's how why I say it. It's biblical. Lance from Michigan. Thank you for your wonderful teaching. You are so very welcome. I recently watched a documentary on Bible Code. They say there are special, specific events and detailed information hidden within the text of the Old Testament. As a Bible scholar, what is your view on this? Thank you, and God bless you. You're so welcome. It's a bunch of malarkey. Okay. The Bible code is. Now, there are messages hidden in acrostics in the Hebrew manuscripts. I call attention to many of them, such as Psalms 37. In the great book of Esther, the sacred name is mentioned five times to show that God puts his hand on that book for reasons that might shock some. But these are acrostics placed there by God. But the Bible code itself, all, all, you know what they're doing? It's the law of averages. Naturally, if, if you take how many times a letter is used in a certain sentence and so forth to make a word out of something, it's going to happen that you can. That's, that's called, uh, you can go to a... a um, any kind of game and the law of averages is going to turn up certain things but that, that's not the way God operates that's why we have the Masara the Masara locks in the manuscripts where, and gives us the messages that God would have us receive in acrostics it's beautiful but um, the way they try to do it, it's a bunch of malarkey. Vicky, I'm not judging, it's just a fact. Vicki from Arkansas. I'm glad you watched the program. Since Satan and his angels have never been born of woman and are being held captive in heaven, which is in the spiritual dimension, then Satan and his angels must be spiritual bodies. When even God himself wanted to enter our dimension, he obtained a physical body by being born of woman as Jesus. Well, he's been here a lot of times beside that. Okay, in uh, Melchizedek, Christ appeared. He didn't have a flesh body. Okay, you want to be careful. Um, so I listened. Um, fallen angels? Uh, do Satan and the fallen angels get physical bodies in any other way? Not work. What was Adam made in? The perfect image of God and the angels. Same body. Okay, different substance. That's all. And they're going to be kicked out in person, de facto, right here on earth. And they will be in their own bodies. They don't need to be born a woman. They want to seduce woman. That's why you're warned. That's why Christ said in Matthew 24, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. Those fallen angels are going to be taken and given in marriage again. Rosa from South Carolina, Shepherd's Chapel, I'm writing to you all to ask two questions. We're in the Bible. It, where in the Bible it is sin for a woman to cut her hair. Second, where in the Bible you are not supposed to visit the grave after you buried someone. This was said to me because I visit my husband's grave often. You, you go ahead and you make that visit, but do know he's in heaven. His spiritual body is, but it's okay out of respect if you want to go there. 
The fact that a woman should not cut her hair is a mistranslation of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But verse 10 tells you why, that a woman should always be covered. It means uh, over her head, not hair, but Christ. She wants to keep Christ and the true word over her head because of the angels. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10. It, why? Because as long as you have Christ over you, they can't, they can't offend you, deceive you, or take advantage of you. When, when they're here, those fallen angels, that's what it's about. It has nothing to do with hair. The same as it uses in, in a verse or so past the tenth that it's a shame for a man to. Uh, why? Because it's a shame for a man have to depend on Christ to keep perverts away from him. That's what it's saying in, in the meaning thereof. Uh, Brandon from Florida. I watch your program at 6 a.m. in the morning before school. Thank you. I watch with my granny. Tell me if we're supposed to watch for the sixth and seventh trumps. Was there ever the other five trumps? Oh, absolutely. The fifth trump and fifth seal are for teaching and um, how precious it is. Well, it's, it's good for you to be watching with your granny. Why do you watch for the sixth and the seventh? Because at the sixth, the false Christ is going to appear. At the seventh, the true Christ is going to appear. And um, you're, you're, you do me real proud that you're aware of those, and thank you for writing. Donna from South Carolina, Pastor Murray, if a person has done everything to keep their family together, brothers and sisters, but all they want to do is talk about one another, they never have peace with anyone. Uh, should I dust my shoes off and move on? And will there be hope in the millennium for my family? I love them very much, but there is so much confusion being around them, especially, and I, I won't go into, there is just no peace at all. Well, don't, mainly don't ever talk Bible to them if they don't receive it, but you always have Second Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. If a family simply does go against you and against the family, separate yourself. Let them know why is what. Or just just read, the, read it for yourself. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, begin reading with verse 6. We as Christians, we do not take necessarily hardships, but at the same time, there are people that are non-believers, but by the grace of God, there go I. And we can be more mature and be understanding of them, but don't participate in their folly. Okay, that's the main thing. Uh, from Puerto Rico, we have Charles. What do you say to someone that under the influence of drugs says to you that he now serves Satan? Well, he prob maybe he does. Maybe he's doing him a service. I would say you're talking to a lost soul, and you want to be very care careful be careful of anybody that uses drugs. They're headed on a slippery slope, and they're going to hit bottom, always. Uh, Satan knows how to use people like that, all right or enough. But the best thing you can do is pray for them and don't let them involve you in trouble. Okay, Ronnie from Tennessee. If I anoint my head with oil and ask God to heal me, how many times must one anoint themselves and ask God for a healing? Once is sufficient, but at the same time, give God a break and go by the health laws if you're ill, because you're, there's something going wrong or you wouldn't be sick in the first place, maybe. We live in a polluted world, and you've got to be very careful. But God tells us what we should eat, and uh, you go by the health laws, and at the same time, you pray. In other words, God may heal you, but if you're taking poison within yourself, then um, you're going to get sick again. So you need to go by the health laws. Don't eat scavengers. They will make you ill. Uh, Donna from New Hampshire. I went to a church yesterday for the first time in many months. I stopped going because of the time wasted listening to man's words. I am hungry for the word of God, so I listen to your program. I'm in closing. Well, thank you. We appreciate the gift. 
to help continue your broadcasting. Thank you. In my area, there are no churches that teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. My question to you is, do you know of any church in my area that teaches as you do? I, I'm willing to even travel. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not, I am not too familiar with um, any church that teaches as we do there. But uh, continue studying with us until you should find one. Um, there's just not that many people that teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse because many preachers think that the word, to, to their chagrin, that the word of God is boring. I don't find it boring at all. I find it vivacious, vigorating, leading, helpful, and exciting when it's taught properly. But um, that's the way it goes. Unfortunately, in seminaries, they are taught not to go above a fourth grade education. You can't cover too much word at that level. But never deal with a controversy. Well, the controversy is between Satan and Christ. So the Bible is a controversy. It's between good and evil. And you're going to have to get down where the rubber meets the road to help people out. So we'll, we'll be remembering you. Okay, we got uh, Crystal. Uh, my name is Crystal. I am a divorced woman of two beautiful kids. One of my daughters is mentally disabled. I divorced my husband because I found out he was doing extremely bad things to her. Lewd acts, child endangerment and administering intoxicating agents to her. After I reported this to the police and he went to prison for it, someone told me God would not like it that I turned him in and divorced him, that I should have stood by my husband and helped him repent and not divorced him because God hates divorce. Well, don't, don't listen to an idiot. Do you realize that God, God is a divorcee? In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, God divorced Israel. Get, I mean, wrote her out a bill of divorcement. And she didn't do anything as bad as your husband did. So you did the right thing. Don't, and, and don't you listen to some clown. That where, 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 were, where was their compassion for your little daughter? That they would tell you that you and her had to put up with this. Um, just all I can tell you is do not listen to idiots. Um, you get, you know, some people read, uh, uh, they, they read a chapter in the Bible and they consider themselves to be scholars of the word. And they're so ignorant, they don't know, come here from Sikkim and, and start giving advice that injures people. Don't worry, God will hold it to their account. Don't you let her hurt you in that way, or him, or whoever did it. You did the right thing. And remember Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. God is a divorcee also. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. There are reasons for divorce, and certainly you had one. Uh, okay, Daisy and Randy from Tennessee. My husband and I watch your program daily, thank you, since we have not found a local church that teaches chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Isn't that sad? It really is that we, we don't have that many teachers, but like you do, we, we feel blessed to listen to God as truth. Uh, and here's my question. My husband understands that the generation of the fig tree is like the millennium years, a thousand years. I thought it was a generation, it is a generation of flesh people, okay, flesh and there are three mentioned in the Bible, 40, 70, uh, two, and, um, and 120. Which one will it be? Well, we'll have to find out. <clears throat> okay, we got Faye from uh, Michigan. I'm a 75-year-old woman who has had problems with my eyes all my life because of a birth injury. I now have giant cell arthritis. It is making my eyesight worse. I enjoy listening to you every day. Thanks to your program, I'm able to at least hear the word and get daily bread of life. Well, bless you. It is good. I knew as a teenager that I, what I read in the Bible did not coincide with what I was being taught in Sunday school and from the pulpit. It is a shame that I didn't have the learning tools and or dig deep enough to know a lot of the truths back then. 
Well, thank you for, for writing and thank you for hanging in there. It's good to have you with us. You're in church here and God takes good care of us and he'll take good care of you. We love you and God does too. Kenny from Fargo, from the, that would be Dakota, give his town. You have a wonderful program. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you. We're going to work at it. We sure are. My younger brother has drawn, has Down syndrome, doesn't understand the good Lord at all. Does he have the green light to heaven? He's innocent and he's heaven bound. This is why we have the millennium. In the spiritual body, he will be perfect, and um, and um, will will um, and that innocency is overcoming. Mary from California, and, and also God has a blessing for you for helping take care of him. Mary from California, how will we know our loved ones in heaven? Will we have eyes, or how will we know them? Of course, we have eyes. We're complete and whole. We're made in the same image we were as angels. Only in, there's just one big difference. There's no such thing as age. So you never get sick and you never age, but you look the same as a, a young person. And that's for an eternity. And I am out of time. You know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I love teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse because it is important what God says, not necessarily what man says. When you read that letter and study it, it makes God's day. That's what's most important. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. Bless Him. He will always bless you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But now, most important, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel.
Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Okay, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Praise God for this great nation, America. You know, when we see our nation pulled together, especially on weekends uh, such as we have this weekend, that Memorial Day, that day set aside when we remember those that made this great